Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken, and I wanted to let you know about a special offer. When you become a patron of the Cordial Catholic Podcast at $8 or more a month, Keith will send you a copy of my new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. To become a patron, just go to patreon.com slash cordial catholic. Hi, hey, welcome to the Cordial Catholic a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm K. Albert Little, an evangelical, non-denominational convert to the Catholic faith, and if there's one thing that I realized as I was asking questions about Catholicism, it was how little I, as an evangelical, understood the Catholic faith. How little those around me, Catholics included, understood the faith. It was once I began to read and hear about Catholicism from actual Catholic sources that I realized how much of what I knew was completely wrong. Backwards. Fake news. This podcast is meant to fill in that gap. We talk to influential Catholic thinkers about Catholic topics from the heart of the Catholic Church. No misinformation here. My guest this week is Matt Swaim. Matt Swaim is the host of the Sunrise Morning Show, and he works at the Coming Home Network International, a network which helps Catholic converts to enter the Catholic Church and navigate those choppy waters. Matt and I talk about how to evangelize your non-Catholic friends and family. It's a really interesting topic, I think, to a lot of listeners of this show, especially if you are a new Catholic or becoming Catholic or recently became Catholic. It's tricky sometimes to navigate those waters. How do you explain the faith to others who might not share the same faith as you? It can be tricky. Matt has some fantastic suggestions. You know, we had this conversation and then realized how little concrete tips Matt actually shared, and we laughed about that, but what he does share is phenomenal. I don't think I've said the word underscore as many times as I've said it in this podcast, because every point he was making, I just felt was so important to underscore, to underline. He makes so many fantastic points about God's grace being the one thing that really brings people in and us needing sometimes to just be quiet, to close our mouths and pray. It's a wonderful interview, and I think you will enjoy it very much. Pilgrimage is something that everyone should experience. You leave behind normal life and travel on a spiritual journey to a sacred place and open yourself up to God's providence giving him the space to enrich and enliven your faith. This podcast is sponsored by Select International Tours and Cruises, who have organized Catholic group pilgrimages for 33 years. If you'd like to lead a group, or if you want to join one that's already in progress, head over to selectinternationaltours.com slash cordial to learn more. Thanks to Select International Tours for sponsoring this show. I encourage you to visit their website and check out their pilgrimages and help support this podcast. It's selectinternationaltours.com slash cordial. Thanks as well to my patrons over at patreon.com slash cordial catholic. You guys are my team, the core that keeps this show running. If you are interested in helping to support this show, even a dollar a month goes a long way to helping. Patrons also receive a special patrons-only behind-the-scenes show, where I share information about upcoming guests, answer questions and feedback, and give you a behind-the-scenes peek into what's happening with the podcast. It's a small way I can give back to those who support this work. If you want to help out, please visit patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. And thank you to everyone who's already supporting this show through their prayers and fasting and financial support. I'm so humbled, guys. I'm so grateful to be able to do this work. It's an absolute dream that, by the grace of God, I can have these fantastic conversations. Conversations like this one with Matt Swain. Please listen and enjoy. Welcome back to the podcast. My guest this week is Matt Swaim. Matt is an author. He is the outreach manager for the Coming Home Network International, 
host of the Sunrise Morning Show on EWTN Radio. He is a Catholic convert and the absolute master of the dad joke. Welcome to the show, Matt. I'm very excited to have you. Well, thanks for having me. I, I mean, the absolute master of the dad joke. I'm, I thought it was still kind of an impre- apprentice mode over here. <laughs> I appreciate the compliment. Hey, if anybody follows you on Twitter, they know that you are in no way an apprentice of the dad joke. You had you you executed, I think, the longest thread I've seen on Twitter with car car puns from the Bible. Car puns like, from the Bible. <laughs> yeah, um, about half of those I stole. About half of them I made up. Uh, so. Um, for instance, the one where Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden in a fury, you know, I did not take that one, nor did I take the one about how uh, Herod demanded the head of John the Baptist in a charger. Uh, <laughs> but there were a few, there were a few that I tweaked, you know, that the, you know, the dove flew out from the ark and came back with a leaf. <laughs> it was a little uh, eco-friendly vehicle joke. <laughs> oh, that was just a fantastic thread, and and that goes to show that you are indeed. There's nobody. There's nobody better. You know, we have a popular. We have a popular radio show up here in Canada on our national broadcaster called As It Happens, and it's a nightly news kind of panel show type thing. And the pun is their thing. So if you ever find yourself out of out of radio work, Matt, you just come up north here. It's not a far drive for you, I, I don't That's think. That's not come too over. bad. It's not too bad. And and they would love to have you as the new host of their show because you would be an endless font. Of... I would I would never take anything seriously. <laughs> I take so little seriously now. Um, you know, of course, you know, Red Green, you being Canadian, you know, had his share of of, of terrible jokes. You know, the dad joke. The dad joke is, I mean. These days in a, in a society, in an outrage culture, and, and, you know, when everybody's just ready to cancel each other, the art of laughing at something because it's funny instead of because it, you know, hurts somebody, it's, it's just a lost art. And it's a great art. The good dad <laughs> joke is just hard to beat. <laughs> That's beautifully said. That's almost poetry. <laughs> okay. <Cool>. So <laughs> our topic today is evangelizing our non-Catholic friends and family. And I know that this is most often, maybe always, the most difficult group of people to evangelize. Often, conversion, this paradigm shift in belief, is something that happens internally. We might read and research and feel this strong pull towards Catholicism, but outwardly, no one has any idea what's going on until suddenly we're entering the Catholic Church at Easter. <laughs> Can you give us a small peek into your own conversion story and maybe how this played out for you? Sure. Uh, well, I can tell you that what you said kind of encapsulates some of it in the sense that a lot of it went on on the inside and a lot of people around me maybe had some snippets and hints of where I was going. Uh, so I grew up uh, pretty strongly evangelically Christian. Um, I guess you could call it that. I was uh, I was Christian in what I would consider probably a non-sectarian sense. I would never have considered myself a Protestant. I didn't even start using that word until I started talking to Catholics. Uh, you know, I grew up in, you know, southwest Ohio and Kentucky and, and places where Catholics were not exactly, you know, super prominent. And if there were, they didn't talk about it. Um, so it, there was a lot of experience in uh, initially the United Methodist Church. Um, that was very brief. Then uh, some really formative times in the Church of the Nazarene. And then uh, later through my uh, high school years, the Free Methodist Church, um, all kind of in the Wesleyan holiness bent, but all you know, committed Christian. And, uh, I kind of had, I'll give you the, the very short cliff notes version of this, um, as a strong Christian going to public schools where, you know, I was mocked and ridiculed for the faith. I had a strong kind of antipathy towards the world, but, um, as a kid in evangelical youth groups who saw among other things, when my pastors have an affair and it blew up our church and our family kind of got thrown out in the mix, um, I had a strong antipathy towards, I guess, consumer-driven evangelicalism or this kind of evangelicalism, evangelicalism that had like a, a veneer of like piety over it. Like uh, this is this is what a good Christian looks like, kind of Christianity. So I went the only place that I could naturally go. I followed people who had an antipathy toward the world and an antipathy towards, you know, commercial, um, superficial Christianity, and I went full on into Christian punk and metal and alternative you know, and into that world, um, played a lot of music for a number of years. And, you know, there's, there's kind of a weird tension that, that this took 
place it, for me. Part of it was this sort of rebellion against all these people who are getting Christianity wrong, but also this heartbreak over the fact that all these Christians weren't getting along. So in the course of that, um, you know, a lot of anger and bitterness, I discovered G.K. Chesterton, and he kind of took all these things that I've been holding in my head as opposites um, and showed me that they would be better understood as paradoxes. And the key to unlock all this understanding of the world as a paradox instead of this series of contradictions and truth is a mystery and an adventure rather than a, a horrible algebra problem was GK Chesterton and Chesterton was the guy. And, and once I discovered him, I was really kind of on the downhill slide towards Catholicism, I guess the uphill climb towards Catholicism. And, uh, so I discovered him probably around my sophomore year of college. And by my junior year of college, I was a hardcore Chestertonian and then by about three years out of college, I was a, I was a Catholic. Um, so, I mean, that's, I left a lot of stuff out, but you know how it is. You, you told your conversion story before for Marcus Grodi. There's, there's no way to pack it into, uh, to an elevator pitch. <laughs> no, there's no way. That, that's a very interesting story, uh, as it is, the, the way you tell it. So, one of the hats you wear is working for the Coming Home Network International, which right. helps non-Catholic Christians to make the leap into the Catholic faith. And so you've heard a lot of stories like yours, uh, like mine, a lot of these conversion stories. You have a lot of experience. Um, and what I'm wondering is for friends and family, they're the hardest to evangelize, as I mentioned before, to explain our newfound faith to. Why do you think it's so difficult to explain a conversion to, uh, to Catholicism to those who are closest to us? Why do you think Jesus could perform no miracles when he came back home? <laughs> it's the same <laughs> problem, right? That's there, exactly it, it. it. That's exactly it, because, you know, Jesus comes back to his own hometown and his own did not receive him, and so he didn't do a bunch of miracles there. They're like— this is a guy who's, you know, healing the sick and, you know, casting out demons everywhere else. But he comes home and we remember him as the guy who used to run around this town in diapers. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the problem here, um, especially when it comes to your parents, um, especially when it comes to your Bible college classmates, especially when it came to some of the people who I was wrestling with these issues with um, as friends. But I came to a conclusion that was completely off the table for them. And some of them felt like I'd betrayed them a little bit. Um that I was no longer, I, I lost all my punk rock street cred, right? Instead of fighting the man, I had joined the ultimate man, right? <laughs> uh, the Pope. Um, so yeah, that's, it's always going to be the hardest. And, you know, bear in mind, I always go back to the story of Monica and Augustine. I mean, Monica prayed with tears over Augustine for decades and to not really much fruit. And then Augustine goes and hears Ambrose and he's like, this guy's a genius. And Monica's probably like, I, I just wonder what the first conversation was like when he, and he came home. And he's like, I just heard this guy. You won't believe how insanely smart he is. And she's probably like, I've been telling you these same exact <laughs> things for 25 years. So, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be hardest with your friends and family. And I don't know why you invited me on as like an expert to talk about this because nobody has followed me in. Like nobody. Um, and I've been in the church for like 15 years. Uh, so – you, you kind of have to be the Monica, but you have to pray for the Ambrose, you know, uh, it, it's, that's, that's, that's the hardest part for us because we want to control people's journey because we know what the pearl of great price is. And they think they know, we, we just want to show them this amazing thing. And they're like, ah, they're not going to listen to me. I mean, they're going to think of me as the idiot punk rock kid who's going through another phase. It's a 15 year phase, but still, you know, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Okay, you brought up a number of things that I want to underscore. Uh, f first of all, you were the person I thought would be worst at this. That's why I picked you. I oh, thought thank I, you. <laughs> you got to start from the bottom and, and yeah. work your way up. Yeah. So next episode will be somebody who actually has experience, you know, bringing people in, into the church. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just, number of fantastic things you've said there. I mean, first of all, of course, Jesus is for everything. He's our ultimate example. And if he wasn't received by his closest family and, and friends, well, that should be that should be solace for us in in yep. some respect, right? 
Yeah, and I mean, gosh, there's even times where you see Jesus preaching, and it says that his mother and brothers are trying to get a message into him, right? I mean, this is Mary, the mother of God. It's not sinful for them to be worried about Jesus, but, you know, you get the sense that they're like, maybe you should get out of the sun for a minute, you know? <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> there's this kind of this, I mean, Mary, Mary knows that she knows what Gabriel told her, and she knows what it's like to have sat alongside and watched this guy develop and to have gone and gotten him at the temple. But at the same time, I mean, even Mary is still trying to figure this thing out as Jesus is growing and 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 uh, living out his his mission. I mean, even at the foot of the cross, who knows what's going through Mary's mind? Um, but that being said, just as your journey and my journey took place primarily internally. I mean, all of our relatives, most of the stuff that's going on in terms of what they think about what we have done is going on internally, too. I mean, we can't presume that the only information that there is to be had about what our family and friends think about us is what they say to us. There's often a lot more going on in in their own thoughts about us than they would ever let on. Um, and, and occasionally it'll creep out. I mean, maybe you've had this happen to you, too, um, where someone will just— in kind of a quiet moment when, you know, the the room is focused on something else and you've got somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they'll say just kind of like one line out of the blue and you're like, really? I can't believe you've been thinking about this thing. <laughs> and then, of course, you get like two sentences out and then somebody comes up and is like, hey, guys, what are you guys talking about? And you're like, well, the moment's gone. <laughs> um, but the, but just as it was just completely internally for, for you and I until kind of the last minute in a lot of ways – for those family and friends, we we can't take for granted that, that the Holy Spirit's working on them, too, that God wants the best for them, too, and you just never know what's going on inside somebody else. Oh, that's such a good point to underscore. <laughs> You're right. Why should we expect that, you know, our own journeys were so internal? Why should we expect somebody else to have this visible, external, loud and proud kind of conversion? Uh, we, we have no idea. That That's a fantastic yeah. point to underscore, you know. I, I yeah. love that. <laughs> well, the other thing that we have no idea about is that, you know, apologetics are a very valuable tool and resource, but they were a valuable tool and resource for me after I was kind of already convinced that the Catholic Church was probably the one true church founded by Jesus Christ, and I had to join it. At that point, I was like, yeah, give me all the apologetics I can take because I need to figure out how, how, how all these puzzle pieces fit together. And yet, when we go to talk to other people who are not— um, part of the church, we tend to lead with the things that would have never have worked on us, right? I mean, I know that the apologetic stuff wouldn't have worked on me until I was already kind of primed in a bunch of other ways. And yet, so often when I see somebody who disagrees with this or that about the church, I'm like, well, I've got the arguments going to sit this guy down. And once he loses this argument, he'll decide that he needs to become Catholic. And the fact of the matter is, is that very often um, the only arguments that you lose that put you in the church are the arguments that you have with God, right? <laughs> it's not the arguments that you have with some guy on Twitter that bring you to the church. Oh, that's so. a, that's also a, uh, that's a fantastic point. You know, I, I think of when I I had a kind of radical coming to Christ moment in high school, um, grade ten. I don't know what you call that in America. We call it. Grade... It's just, that'd be a sophomore. <laughs> sophomore. Yeah, thanks. I'm learning things now. We, it, you know, I had this radical experience where I became a Christian out of a family of kind of nominal Christians. I had my own coming to Christ kind of experience. And it was very profound. It was very dramatic. It was, it, it turned my life completely around. Um, I was this punk rock kid uh, prior to that. And I became a I feel Christian. Like you and I might have hung out. I think we may have. We probably would have been friends in real life. I right? listened to some Canadian bands, you know, so. <laughs> So I, you know, I became a Christian punk rock kid at, at, at that point, but I was excited about my faith back then in, in high school, and I would have gone around to everyone evangelizing in all the worst kind of ways, right? Like you said, yeah. using these apologetic arguments, and we didn't have Twitter back then, but I would have been on, right. you know, whatever platform we, I All I the could stuff have. that would have never <laughs> yeah. worked on you, yeah. right? Yeah, but, but we somehow think it's going to work on other, other people. And I think, for me, I applied that story to my Catholic conversion as well, because, again, I'm, I'm learning something new. You, you mentioned finding this pearl of, of great price, and we often right. de describe the Catholic Church in that way because it's, it's such an apt parable that Jesus uses. You find this amazing thing, and you want to share with everybody, but you go, you, you go out just you know, throwing everything against the wall and hoping that something sticks and the worst kind of arguments and, and you're just so excited you want to share this and you're not so tactful at, at that point. Right, 
Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so I, I did tweet something the other day because it, it just kind of occurred to me, you know, if, uh, if a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, then you and I are probably as crazy as the craziest person we get sucked into an argument with. And <laughs> that seems to happen every time we take this approach is that instead of talking to the people who are rational and are ready to hear it, we end up talking to the people who are like, you know, hair on fire, like completely antithetical to all the things that we're trying to say. So, yeah. And, and I think that it also brings back around this, this other, other aspect of evangelization that, that we need to, I think, reclaim, um, as the church, because, you know, our, our, you grew up evangelical. Um, I mean, you're, you're at least, especially after your conversion, you, you were you're deeply into this sort of thing. And you understand if you've been in this much and the work of evangelization, the work of sharing the gospel, that ultimately the stuff that works is the personal stuff, the pers- stuff that's, that's based in relationships. Um, and that's based in you sharing your story, you being real about what God has done in your life. And that's the kind of stuff that sort of opens the door and paves the way for these other things. And so for, for a lot of uh, our loved ones, you know, I think we, we want to go back and say how wrong they are on these issues. And we, we're, we're so on fire to do it because in part, we used to think the exact same things. And that's why we're madder at those ideas because we know how taken we were by them at a certain point. Uh, but the relationship, you can't sacrifice the relationship for this because the relationship is what will sustain it, uh, sustain the conversation over time. Um, you can shut off a conversation as I did many times. I mean, you'd want to talk about mistakes I made, you know, coming out firing both barrels overzealous with people, uh, and, and shutting down communication with some people for years, some people who I still don't talk to anymore because I came, I came on too strong, uh, rather than thinking the relationship is the priority because the relationship is going to sustain the conversation long term, And that's how I'll get to, they'll get to see over time what this looks like in my life. Yeah. I, that's so important. I think about a couple of times when I was journeying into the Catholic faith and I was reading different different books and a very good friend of mine had asked, you know, what what we could read together and I just picked the the just the worst book I could have picked. It was just a I can't remember the name of the book. Um it, it was a fantastic book, but for the stage that we were at, I wouldn't have I uh, picked it in hindsight because it was just essentially 101 arguments for the Catholic faith. And it just went boom, <laughs> yep. boom, 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 boom. And little 101 con- <laughs> reasons why you, my friend, are wrong about everything. Well, that's what, right? it, you know, that's I think. a great way to build a bridge. <laughs> I think that was the subtitle. And, you know, it, it wasn't the approach that worked. It was fruitful. It was terrible. And I think it ended up just the people I recommended that book to in my zeal for the Catholic faith. That book just pushed them further away. And it wasn't the book wasn't the book's fault. It was <laughs> it was my fault for thinking that I could just thrust this book of here are all the reasons why you're wrong into their hand and expect any kind of fruit to come from that. Yeah, well, I mean, because at that point, it's the it's the ego. Um, and, and this is, okay, so, you know, not to get to, into too much Pope Francis stuff, but there's something that um, he's said a couple of times that I think is a really important distinction if you understand, uh, you know, what he's getting at, that, that proselytism is often... Solemn nonsense, I think he referred to it as. Um, and the difference between proselytism and evangelization, because proselytism is, I know the truth, and you guys are all wrong, and I'm about to show you all why you're wrong. If the goal is to show everybody why they're wrong, then you're, that's the right approach. If the goal is to win people for the kingdom, then you, you have to do a little bit harder work. You know, you have to kind of get in and, and know a person. You have to figure out what they actually care about. Until you've listened a little bit, you don't even know what this other person actually cares about. And the fact of the matter is the church has something for everyone, no matter what you care about most. And until you can figure out what aspect of the church is going to make the most sense to somebody, I mean, it's kind of hard to to really make much progress because all you're doing is just leading with your favorite things. And that's that makes the makes the whole conversation about you. It doesn't even make the whole conversation about the church. It makes the whole conversation about you. So, oh, that's a, that's a we would call that a good word back in my Pentecostal days. That's a, a very good word. That's, that's a, good, a good, word. good word, brother. Uh, brother Keith's got a word of prophecy, bro. He's going to prophesy over you. <laughs> but it, it is because what you say there is so true. It is we make it about our ego, don't we? When we lead with the things that we. Um, think are maybe most important without listening to that person. 
I, I think of a, a heartbreaking moment for me in, in my conversion was when the, uh, the pastor of the church my wife and I were attending, we were chatting with him and his wife a bit about our, our journey, and he asked me to give him a book that most influenced me. And I gave him a copy of Rome Sweet Home because everybody has read that book if you're a Catholic convert, and I thought, this is a fantastic story. And I remember he read it and kind of said, well, it's okay, but doesn't really resonate with me. And I was heartbroken, yeah. because I thought, here is, how could you read this book and, and not become Catholic? Was well, what I was bear thinking. in mind, you've gone through a completely set of experience, different set of experiences before you got to that book than this guy had. This guy just got it dropped out of the sky. Yeah, well, that's what I, and that's what I've realized and come to reconcile in hindsight. I, I talked earlier on the podcast way back when to uh, Dr. Doug Beaumont about this, oh, and course, he, yes. and he had a very similar story where he ended up becoming Catholic and going through some of the old boxes in his office. I think he said, and he found a copy of Rome Sweet Home, uh, full of highlighting and underlining. He said, but he had no memory of of reading it because he he read it and those arguments at the time didn't resonate at all with him. He underlined right. it and kind of had the question marks. And, and he said, now that he's a Catholic, those are the same arguments that he, he deeply loves and uses in conversation with others. But when he first read that book, it, it didn't even, it didn't even land at all for him. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. So for me, kind of the hardest things for me to kind of wrap my head around were the papacy and apostolic succession. Uh, that all wrapped up in authority and the question of a visible church. Um, the it, and well, we'll say the other one was was Mary, um, was a big one. So those are the ones that I threw all, all my research and study into, probably more than anything else. And so as a result, those are kind of the two areas that I feel most prepared, you know, to defend if someone attacks them. That being said. I, it's easy for me to forget because I've done so much research and study it, and those two concepts of you know the papacy and apostolic succession and and the primacy of Our Lady in salvation history as the human who said yes to God, like all that stuff. It's, I it's easy for me to forget how hard that used to be for me and how hard it therefore is to other people, um, because I, I've spent so much time and energy on those arguments. So. The, the stuff that really got me at the beginning wasn't those things. The stuff that got me at the beginning was um, beauty and imagination and wonder and the, the, the steps in the process that led me to kind of an opening of the heart towards understanding the world in a sacramental way. Uh, and there's not really like an argument you can give to, to make that work, except for maybe like take someone into a cathedral and say nothing. Right. Or put them in front of the blessed sacrament and say nothing. I mean, there's not really like an argument you can make for those kinds of things. And a lot of the things that draw people to the church are not the kinds of things that you can really make an argument for. Once they're disposed in that direction, the arguments make sense. But in this culture where your facts are your facts and my facts are my facts and there's alternative facts over here and you can make two people can look at the same bar graph and make it say whatever they want. And where we've got thousands of denominations who are looking at the same scripture and making it say whatever they want. I mean, until you've kind of got your heart disposed in a certain way, it's it's hard to. It's just one person's word against another word. Um, yeah, and I think here's where we we have to put our money where our our mouth is in terms of trusting God. Right? We can yeah we can say we can say from now and until forever how we trust God and rely on God for all these things. But it seems to me that when it comes to the 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 fate the um you know the soul the souls or the the faith lives of our non Catholic Christian friends and family, it seems like we're so hesitant to give up just just you know arguing and you know taking it on ourselves to, yeah. to bring them into the church rather than just relying on God who I think has to be the one to to provide that initial has drive. always been the one right this is a fundamental misunderstanding of, of Catholic theology I think that we do it all on our own but I mean you know, Paul says I planted a seed Apollos watered it only the Holy Spirit gives the increase. Yeah, we, I mean, you can throw everything you want to out there, but nothing's going to happen without the move of the Holy Spirit, or as we talk about all the time at the Coming Home Network, the mystery of grace. 
Yeah. I mean, it, this is this is part of the, the issue, too, is that we look at all this like it's solving a math problem instead of understanding a poem. Right. It's this this whole question of, of how are people drawn to God is not like, well, you insert, you know, three milligrams of X into equation. You know, this, that's not it's there's not some formula for it. It's not a science project. It's not a math problem. It's more like a love story. I mean, at the end of the day, salvation history is written that way, too. It's a love story with lots of drama and weird stuff that I would have never put in there if I was the one writing it. So, Oh, that's brilliantly put. It's more like a poem than a math equation. You're, Of course, you're, you're exactly right. <laughs> that's what it is. I, I think, too, of, of St. Monica again. I think of my own faith journey. I... You know, I became uh, an evangelical Christian in a family of nominal Christians, and for a long time, I I prayed for other family members. And recently, uh, you know, for a long time, I mean, for 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 a decade, more than a decade, I would pray for my family members to um, to to know Jesus how I knew Jesus, even before I became Catholic. You know, this is what I was always praying, and then. By this incredible working of, of grace, my my parents found a local evangelical church, and my mom made the decision to be baptized. And they're, they're not into the Catholic Church, and you know we're in different places still. But that movement, that journey, was something that I prayed for. And you know, I, I said this in tears at her baptism. I was asked to speak, but. It's the idea of of the hound of heaven, right? I mean, yeah, we. I, I was praying this prayer for over a decade, and and all along, despite how it may have looked, God was pursuing my family members that I was praying for. Um, like we said before, it's not necessarily an external thing that we can see happening because our own journeys weren't external either, in large part. But it, it was something that I had to trust God with. And, and hey, it, it took all this time, but like St. Monica, and I'm not comparing myself to, I am no St. Monica, <laughs> but that story resonates deeply with me because I have my own version of that story. And that happened, that, that thing I was praying for, you know, actually, actually came to fruition despite years and years and years of looking like nothing was happening. My prayers were answered and it was this amazing kind of thing. Yeah, and there are crazy stories out there of, you know, people saying, you know, giving God timelines and God honoring the timelines, but that's very, very rare. It only happens, and usually the people that happen to are like canonized saints. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you've got that going on, but I, you know, I'm, I have, my roots are in Kentucky, so I have to, have to kind of go this direction. I, I think it's important to pay attention to how often our Lord talks about fishing and gardening, right? Uh, because... I don't know how much you fish in Canada. I've been fishing in Canada. The fishing's good there. <laughs> uh, or how often you've set out to plant a garden. But there's only so much you can do when you go to plant a garden or you go to fish. You know sort of what's got to happen. Like you know a few of the pieces you have to put into place, but a lot of it's just kind of waiting around and hoping that things you can't control work out in the way that you've, kind of prepared for i mean i can go out to fish and i know what you're supposed to do to catch a fish but i can come home and catch nothing was i doing it wrong or was the fish just not interested that day you know i mean there's a reason that the lord talks about fishing all the time there's a reason that the lord talks about gardening all the time i mean you look at how many variables go into just planting a, a freaking window box right you just never know what bird's going to come by and eat it, what squirrel's going to get in there and dig it up and, and steal it, what weeds, what you know, dandelion fluff is going to get in there and choke it out. You just never know. You just got to be faithful in like the little stuff and patient to like a really enormous extent. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I think it comes back to this idea of thinking that we can control other people even though we know if we were to reflect on our own journeys – that a lot of this happened kind of independent of the people around us. A lot of this was like, didn't really rely on a lot of interactions with anybody, in my case, who was alive. It was me and a lot of dead people sorting this out in books. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that 
I mean, this is something that I've learned over 15 years of me being Catholic and nobody following me in and me getting like one question, like every three holidays from like one family member. And I can never tell who's going to be the one, but you just have to kind of realize that the Holy Spirit is in the long game. The Holy Spirit wants people for good. The Holy Spirit is not interested in you winning a debate as much as uh, another soul coming home to the kingdom. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's that's important for me. I have to remind myself of this constantly because it's so easy for me to default to the win, right? I'm going to own this bad argument uh, instead of saying, well, what's, how's this person hurting? And, and what healing does the church offer them? And how can I be a minister of that? Yeah, that's such a fundamental point to underscore. And as you said earlier, that's the harder thing to do, right? It's it's easy to win the argument. That's sometimes. why nobody does it. That's <laughs> yeah. why I don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's easy to win the argument uh, when you know all the apologetic answers, but it's harder to actually build that relationship, right? Um, so when I was journeying into the church, and I think this jumps off from what you kind of just said, I had a I had a blog, and it was more of a place for me to spiritually and even psychologically work out what I was going through. I had and, the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank goodness, uh, Blogspot eventually like got a virus and took the whole thing down. I don't know if I stand by all the stuff that I wrote. In, uh, today. <laughs> Look, you don't have a live journal. <laughs> no, I, my my live journal, my Zanga is not up. <laughs> so. You know, the, the blog for me was primarily a tool to work up my own thinking and to, to share with some friends and family who might be interested, and a, a few were. Now, I wouldn't suggest that everyone who's becoming Catholic start a blog, but what are some things you think that they can do, especially as they're in the process of converting, that can help someone to share their faith so it's not as much of a surprise um, to the people around them? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that's, this is a tough one because it really depends on what kind of situation you're in. Uh, you know, some people come from families that are maybe, they may adhere to some doctrine or dogma or, or whatever, but practically they're relativists. Um, you know, this this happens a lot uh, on moral questions especially, and it, and it happens a lot in, in faith questions. So some people say, well, that's that's good for you. I'm glad that you're doing that. You know, not really my thing. Uh, you know, so you kind of have to approach it differently for that person. That person really has to see something radically change in you uh, for for it to make sense. But but even for even for someone who's completely antithetical, so, I mean, sometimes sometimes it's easier to win over people who are really hostile than it is for someone who just doesn't care. Um, and sometimes the the really hostile person needs to see the unexpected thing or hear the unexpected thing. Um, and and that that may be just the that you are living completely differently, or it may be that you respond to situations differently, or it may be that you have an insight that is completely out of the blue, and they're like, "Well, where did you get that?" And you're like, "Well, Catholic social teaching." <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, just you never know um, until you kind of figure out who who it is that you're working with. So, for instance, uh, you know, my own family, I know that certain things don't work when I'm talking to with, with my mother. It's just better to not. Uh, it's better for me to disappear and go to mass on a vigil when we're visiting, uh, because, you know, if I miss her Sunday school class on Sunday morning, it's not that I've chosen a different theology. It's that I've disrespected my mother. You know, I mean, it's, that's not an argument situation, you know, because my father's a little more cerebral. And if you're, he and I are going to discuss something, then you kind of have to take your time between sentences. You want to get it out slow. He's going to give it back slow. You're going to think about it. It's not going to be, it's not going to be podcast ready. Let's just say, <laughs> you know, or, and, and, you know, with other family members, um, they may think that you're going crazy and that you're going through a phase. And part of the deal is that you just got to stick it out and show over sometimes a long period of time that no, this is not a phase. Um, because for me, I mean, people are like, well, he went through his punk rock phase. Maybe he's going through his Catholic phase. Um, but again, there's, there's, this is, this takes different shapes and, and forms, uh, depending on who you are and who it is that, that you're, you're trying to, to share this with. Um, it's a very different situation if you are someone who's involved in a ministry or leadership. And of course the coming home network deals with those people very often privately, like right up to the last moment, because if someone finds out that pastor Bob's thinking about becoming Catholic, they're not going to wait for pastor Bob to announce it before they run Pastor Bob out of town, <laughs> you know. 
Uh, so, 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 so yeah, I, there's no one size fits all. That's the problem with this. It, it's ultimately a human question and it's ultimately a personal question. Um, I think it's kind of how you have to approach it on your end is, is think you know, what, not like, what's the email blast I can put out to everybody. So it makes sense to everybody, but like how to make sense to Jeff, you know, how might it make sense, to, make sense to like Mary or whoever. You yeah. Know? You know, I, I think about when we had our, our, our first son baptized, we were just shortly uh, new, newish Catholics. And when my wife had just entered the church at that Easter. And this was a few months later, we had our son baptized and we were trying to think out, trying to think about what we could say, what email we could send to all of our family to invite them. And there also, is no email. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like that's like saying, what book can I give to my fallen away son that will bring him back to the church? There ain't no book. If you gave it to him, he wouldn't read it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's the thing. It's, yeah, it's that, it's that there's no one size fits all, like you said. And that makes it harder. <laughs> but it, it ultimately, <laughs> that's, that's the reality, right? <laughs> Wait, doesn't, isn't that what makes it more beautiful though, too? I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm only going to toot the horn of this program because I've been involved with it for such a short amount of time. So I'm tooting other people's horns technically, but the journey home has been on since September of 1997. If we were telling the same exact story for 22 years, people would be like, Oh, well, here goes the same story again. No, but every story is unique and brilliant. And some of them are rapid fire. Some of them are like two decades of journeying. Sometimes it's, that's part of what makes it beautiful is the fact that, this manifests itself so personally and individually, even though it's the one truth. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's brilliantly put. You're, because you're right, of course. If that show, if there were one story, there'd be one episode. And I think, I think when Marcus Grodi, the the host of the Journey Home, was on this program, he said the same thing. He said, if there was just one story, then well, it would have been told, and it would have been over after one <laughs> one episode. But there are so many entry points into the church and so many different stories that the show has lasted that long be because of that reason. Well, and not only that, you know, people are like, well, what's the main reason co people come into the church? I'm like, which people? <laughs> you know, because some people come in because of the church's teaching on contraception, which is not something that we lead with. Uh, you know, some people are like, well, we feel like there should be a moral aspect to the way that we go about, you know, raising a family. And the only people who seem to have their heads screwed on about this correctly are the Catholic Church. I wonder what else they're right about. You know, some people come in through, like I did, reading a lot of Flannery O'Connor and J.R.R. Tolkien, right? Uh, some people come in because, like, they have some, and this happens with academics more than anybody else for some reason. They, like, you know, are studying and philosophizing, and they're very dry intellectuals. Then they have some kind of, like, weird mystical experience with the Blessed Mother, and then they're in. Um, you know, it's, there's no... It's one, it's one story, but it hits us all different. Um, and again, I, to bring it back to, you know, the kind of the original question, you have to realize that what hits you isn't going to be what hits somebody else. And your goal more than anything else should be to just be faithful. Because sometimes the biggest thing people are looking for is, does somebody else out there actually believe this? I mean, think about the, the crisis of faith that we've had for, you know, decades uh, over the belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. I was hanging out with a non-Catholic friend uh, for dinner the other day. His wife's Catholic, and we always joke that one of these days he's going to convert, and he showed me some meme about, like, uh, this, like, sacramental DMV, and the line for the Eucharist is, like, 50 people long, and the line for confession is empty. He's like, you know, y'all don't act like you believe this stuff. Why should I? <laughs> I'm like, what if he saw us actually living like we really believed what the church teaches about the real presence of Jesus in the sacrament of the altar. I mean, sometimes people just need to see that we believe it in order to like trigger them that, well, if they believe it, maybe it is true. Um, yeah, I gave and, you, I, I've given you no concrete or practical <laughs> advice, by the way. No, that. well, you know what? And I, I, I think that is, that's perfect because that underscores, I think the big problem here is that there is no, one size fits all. There isn't necessarily this concrete, practical advice. You've said a number of times, and, and you're right. It's this, we have to live out our faith like we mean it. We have to look for opportunities to, to share that faith, but not, not go out with these apologetic arguments and smatter them everywhere and think that's going to convince people. Oftentimes, 
they'll be convinced by, I mean, this is hard, by our actions, right? Yeah, or convinced by the weird little stuff that you didn't realize you were doing. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's... It's 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 weird uh, the the kinds of things that make an impact on on people. So like, there's uh, one guy um, Mark Gamble was talking about. Uh, he was on the journey home a number of years ago, and he has a written story for us as well. And he was talking about this friend of his, Pat, um, and uh, he knew Pat went to church and seemed to be a faithful and committed guy and and loved Jesus. And then when he found out Pat was Catholic, he's like, wait, there must be some mistake here. Uh, you know, I didn't think that Catholics were like into reading the Bible or into being like, you know, defenders of the sanctity of like just because he'd never met one before. And it wasn't that Pat did like a specific thing or said a specific thing. It's just that he's like, oh, Pat's Pat's not what I expected. Right. When I think of like my stereotype of, of, of Catholics and and it, and it's always weird. It's always the weird stuff and the weird stuff that has an impact on you and that hits you out of the blue hits you because it is weird, but it also is the kind of stuff that we can't fabricate or plan. You know, it's the, it's the person who's listening to the radio and a James Taylor song comes on and it there's like one line that like hits them between the eyes and they're crying and it's raining. So they pull over and they look up and they're in St. Cecilia's church parking lot. That's the kind of stuff that you and I can't control, but that when people come on to the show to tell their stories, that's the kind of stuff that they share, you know? And we have to kind of have our ears open. It is, and I'm sure Marcus said a hundred times when you had him on, it's grace. We're not responsible for like mediating the grace. We're just responsible for being faithful to the grace that's been given to us. Uh, Cause you never know how it's going to work out. It's always the weird stuff. Yeah. And you know, it is. And that, that's what makes it so much harder. But this is how God has designed the, the system of, you know, the way salvation works, right? We can't mediate that grace. We can't bring a person to this point. We can't force them to, to convert, to listen to our, all of our apologetic arguments. We can't control James Taylor on the radio or the rain or the location of, of St. Cecilia's church. We, we, we have to surrender to a certain degree, and, and trust that our prayers mean something, our living our life as best we can, receiving the sacraments and, and trying to live a faithful Catholic life. We have to trust that that is going to uh, do something as, as an evangelical witness, right? Yeah, well, you have to, uh, because ultimately, if it was about sales, then you and I would be out of a job. I mean— I remember uh, uh, going back to the proselytism question. I was uh, when I was playing in you know this Christian kind of alternative rock band back in the early '90s, and we were doing a food drive concert. And I was calling around, and I got embroiled with this independent fundamentalist Baptist guy who was saying that there's no way he's sending his youth group there because we were, you know, playing devil music from African drum beats, and it was a it was a convoluted thing. We were offering strange fire before the Lord. We were, the earth was going to open up and consume us. And anyway, at the end of this conversation. He was like, there's no way that what you're doing can possibly lead people to the Lord. I'm like, well, but, and he's like, how many people have you led to the Lord this week? And I was like, uh, he's like, just tell me, give me a number. How many people have you led to the Lord this week? He was thinking in terms of sales, right? And I think that, that that's such a temptation, even for those of us who are not wired like fundamentalist, independent Baptist pastors from Kentucky. Um, we want the numbers, but it's not like a math problem. I mean, to the Calvinists, it might be. Uh, but to to us, it's, I mean, grace is weird and mysterious. Um, and it it takes as long as it takes. I mean, uh, and you and I and, and anybody listening right now who's on board with what we're saying knows because if they look at their own lives, it's never one thing. It's never one argument. It's a process. And we know this because we talk about how all the time how it's not once saved, always saved. It's not like you're going to win the deal. I mean, people are often converted in a moment, but it's not the moment that you controlled, right? It's some other moment. You just got to be faithful. So, oh, that's so that's so well put, and that brings us back to thinking about the journey of others in terms of our own journey. If we had an internal journey, we can't expect theirs to be external. 
If we had a, yeah. a journey that wasn't just one singular moment of, of conversion, then we, we can't expect theirs to be the same thing. I, that just reminds me to, to keep thinking of those we're praying for and those we are trying to witness to in terms of how we ourselves receive those prayers and, and that witness, right? Yeah, there's that. And I think also we, we need to quit it with the own goals, man. We need to quit shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, we need to quit messing up the easy game. Like, how, when's the last time you went to your church and you heard your pastor in the announcement saying, we want to welcome all visitors. If any of you are interested in more information or about becoming Catholic, please see so-and-so after Mass. When's the last time you heard that announcement? I mean... <laughs> every you, every week, brother. <laughs> oh, you get... I love my parish. <laughs> oh, you see, you're in a great time. You're, you're the exception, not the rule. Or, I mean, we're... I mean, without you're, you're right. A, you're right. A guy though, who you're working point. with, who was calling us because he he's uh, bedridden and wants to become Catholic, and he's called three local parishes, and nobody will return his calls. There's, he's he's right there in the bed waiting for you to come in and just drop the oil on him. I mean, he's right there, and we're, wow, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So. We have to stop with our own goals, man. We have to we have to stop shooting ourselves in the feet. And sometimes you just got to notice the people who are already in the pews who've been coming for five years with their wife, but they're not Catholic yet. And all they need is just somebody to say, "Hey, have you thought about actually joining up?" Yeah, you're you're exactly right. I, I think of your point about the the idea of sales, right? I I one of the churches that I was part of when I was uh, first became Catholic, first became Christian, I should say. You know, we we had the traditional altar call every Sunday, and if you, you know if you want to accept Jesus into your life, raise your hand or come to the front, and and you know I see that hand, yeah, I then, see that hand, exactly, exactly. You've been there, amen. I've been you know, there, but but then account is taken, like and 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 sadly the effect, the in quotes effectiveness of that Sunday morning service is then based on how many people like that independent Baptist pastor you were talking about, your your own spiritual worth or value or success, in quotes, is then measured by how many people you have saved, in quotes, right? And we can apply the same thing to— Well, you to, didn't save any of them is the problem with <laughs> the thinking, right? <laughs> well, that's—yeah, that's that's exactly the thing, right? We can bring that way of thinking into, into our Catholic conversion as well, right? Well— Oh, nobody, nobody's followed me into the church, or oh yeah, so and so became Catholic, and so did so and so, and then we 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 make it into like you say a math problem, or a singular moment of conversion, or a sales job rather than just praying and living the Catholic life and looking for opportunities and trusting in God's grace, right? Yeah, and and trusting in the long game. You know that there are people from the like 13th century who built random you know, cathedrals in random towns in Europe who are actively evangelizing millennials who are taking a year abroad because they don't want to do college right now. They're dead people who've been dead for like 700 years who are actively evangelizing the nuns, right? You just never know what just being faithful will do. Uh, Because, I mean, how many times have you had the conversation with someone who's like, I just walked into this cathedral and I just looked up and I thought, this is beautiful and it made me start, it stirred something in me and I can't explain it. They're dead Belgians who are having a better impact for the kingdom than people with podcasts. <laughs> oh, <all> no. <laughs> I'm not talking about this podcast. Oh, of course not. I'm not talking about my radio <laughs> show. Not. I'm just saying that, like, we think that we're so smart and, and brilliant, but I don't oh. know. I haven't built the cathedral. That's t- <laughs> I got work to do. <laughs> you got kids. They're too busy. That's right. That's such a good point. You know, we... We often think it's down it's down to us and our witness and and how effective we're being and the right arguments and but there you go thinking about those those cathedrals those those books that were written those those prayers people prayed all that that, that long time ago way back when and th- those things are can you imagine the person building the cathedral you know in thirteen hundreds. I can't imagine that person would ever have had in their mind that 
700 years later. Somebody's going to go put this on their Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. They probably wouldn't have thought that. Eh? They probably would have been right, exactly. thinking about like, I mean, MSN no Messenger think about right, back right. then. <laughs> it was, they were still on AIM back in, yeah. back in the 13th century. <laughs> That's such a good point to underscore. I, I love that, right? That we have no idea. I think about a story that I heard about um, there's a local not localish, but it's in it's in Canada, an evangelical seminary that is built on the grounds of a former monastery. So the mm. monastery closed, this evangelical college bought the monastery. And there was there's there's been a disproportionate number of people becoming Catholic out of that monastery. Um, and then somebody did did the digging and realized that well one of the main intentions of these of these nuns who were praying for hundreds of years or so was for conversions to the Catholic faith. And those nuns are all passed away. They're they're now the church triumphant in, in heaven. But you know, it's 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 that idea that they would never have had an idea of the impact of their their prayers. They're long gone. But then here is clear tangible fruit of their prayers happening. Much like these yeah. cathedrals that that were built, you know. That just tells me that we can't we can't you know put a time limit on our on our on our prayers, on, on these expectations of God, we can't possibly know even the, the impact that we have. No, you can't. Uh, and again, this is the Holy Spirit's into the long game. You know, the whole, the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to get people and keep them. Uh, this is, this is something that we have to understand. And the Holy Spirit wants these people to come home more than you or I do. Uh, so sometimes fidelity is the best option, even if it means sometimes just holding your tongue. Because uh, sometimes people are like, well, that guy is smart enough to not talk right now. Maybe he's on my side. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's the, the ability to just hold your tongue when everybody else is losing their minds. That might be a drawing point. You just never know. Yeah, and you're right. That's such a good thing. Oh, I keep saying, I keep underscoring your points because you're making so many good ones. But the Holy Spirit does well, this, want. This is a very rare day for me then. You're on fire today. <laughs> The Holy Spirit does want those people in the Catholic Church more more than we do. More than you or I. That's an incredible thing to think about right there. Right? Just yeah. that. Just that's worth this podcast, eh? Just that little tidbit. Because you're right. You, you know, if if we can truly reflect on that idea, I think there's so much power in that and so much freedom from us having to worry about you know, say it's our incredibly liberating to think about that. There's I don't know if you read any Wendell Berry. Uh, but he's he's a kind of this agricultural philosopher, as it were. He's from Kentucky, uh, but he's got this thing called uh, Manifesto, the the Mad Farmers Liberation Front, and he uh, he talks a little bit about this game plan for revolutionizing the world. And he says, plant sequo- sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say the leaves are harvested when they've rotted into the mold, and call that profit. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Um, the idea of you want to change the world, go have a baby and raise it. You know, you want to change the world, as Mother Teresa said, go home and love your family. We're we're so obsessed with programs and so obsessed with arguments that we forget that God has trusted us with some crazy things within the four walls of our own living space. And sometimes the biggest impact we're going to have on the world for generations is going to happen right there. So I don't have any advice specifically about technically what you're supposed to do through all that. I'm just saying you got to remember that. That's that's fantastic. And I think that's a perfect place for us to end this interview and for me to to thank you so much because I think this has been I don't think you ever answered any of my any of my I questions answer, with any concrete tangible <laughs> I could run for office. This is amazing. Oh, well, I'd vote for you. Uh, what, anything you want to share with the listeners where they can find out more about you? I mean, turn on the radio, folks, and let's listen to you. But what do you want to share with the listeners where they can find out more information about the incredible Matt Swaim? Uh, well, it's not that incredible. But uh, if you listen uh, at 6 a.m. Eastern every morning on EWTN Radio, the Sunrise Morning Show, um, my co-host Anna Mitchell's on maternity leave. but uh, So right now I'm flying a little bit solo. Uh, with me and my engineer, Paul. But uh, you can always check out the work of the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. I really encourage people especially to check out the online community 
um, because that's a social network curated and run by us that's full of people who are converts and on the journey, kind of supporting each other along the way. And if you want the dad jokes, <laughs> at Matt Swaim. <laughs> There you go. And if you ever want to follow, if you ever need a reason to get a Twitter account and a person to follow, at, at Matt Swaim is where it's at. You will not be disappointed. I can. You'll be disappointed, but you won't have wasted your time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Well, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. This oh, has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, no, I'm really flattered. I'm, you, you had so many cool people on before me. I was like, man, maybe I'm just not cool enough to be on. <laughs> hey Albert Little show you. <laughs> I thought we were raising the cool factor by a whole bunch by having you on. So so I'm glad. I'm glad you were willing. Hey, you got you got some great podcasts. I've I've enjoyed a lot of them. So thank you for the privilege. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh God bless you. God bless your family and God bless the work you are doing for the church. Thanks so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Cordial Catholic Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this fantastic conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Matt Swain was a fantastic guest. I learned a ton, and it's really stuff worth reflecting on in depth. I absolutely love it. Visit thecordialcatholic.com for notes on this show, for my blog and articles I've been writing. I have a bunch of new things up that I've written in the past few weeks. Please do check those out. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you find it. We're everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Google Music, Last.fm, Tuned In, Spotify, you name it, we are there. Please subscribe to the podcast, and if you can, please leave a rating and a review. Those ratings and reviews go a long way to help others to find the podcast and push it out to new people and get the algorithms to recommend it, and that helps to grow the audience. I really appreciate those ratings and reviews, and thank you to those who've already left ratings and reviews. Email me at cordialcatholic at gmail.com. I love your feedback very much. I love hearing from the audience what you're thinking, what you want to hear, what you didn't like. All your feedback is very valuable for me. I'm on Twitter at Cordial Catholic, on Facebook at The Cordial Catholic, and uh, look me up there as well. If you want to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash cordialcatholic, where even $1 a month goes a very long way into helping me afford to do this. It's not my job, and I appreciate all your support to help make it happen. Thanks for listening, see you next week, and God bless. <laughs>